afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon for, from Hawaii. My name is David Santoro, and I'm Vice President and Director for Nuclear Policy Programs at the Pacific Forum. Welcome to the second edition of uh, the US Singapore Indo Pacific Conversation Series, our virtual webinar series organized in partnership with the S. Uh, Rajaratnam School of International Studies, RSIS which is uh, generally, gen generously supported by the US Department of State through the US Embassy in Singapore. So as you all know, Singapore and the United States are not formal treaty allies, but we have enjoyed a broad and deep security partnership that has spanned decades. One explanation is that this is due to Singapore's security concerns in its immediate neighborhood and that US presence helps uh, maintain Singapore's autonomy and security. Another reason is that this is because of America's need for home, quote unquote, in Southeast Asia. Since the Philippines decided to close US bases in Luzon in the early 1990s, Singapore became an alternative host to US naval presence in the region. So clearly this relationship has benefited not just Singapore and the United States, but also the wider region. But with, um, I would argue that um, with increasingly complicated security challenges ranging from maritime to cyber, we need to reflect on the future of the security and defense relationship between Washington and, and Singapore. So for that, we are joined today by two experts who will review these issues, underscore the contribution of the US-Singapore relationship to regional security and stability, and offer perspectives on how the two countries can continue to advance their relations amidst the evolving complex challenges that the region and the subregion faces. So we will first hear from uh, Tan Si Seng, who is professor of international relations at RSIS. Professor Tan Si Seng is also an elected member of the NTU Advisory Board and has written or edited 17 books and monographs and published over 80 scholarly articles and book chapters. His latest books uh, include The Responsibility to Provide in Southeast Asia and The Legal Authority of ASEAN as a security institution, both of which were published in 2019. We will, we will then hear from Ver Verley Nguyens, who is a research fellow at the International Security Studies Department of the Roy Royal United Services Institute, and whose research interests focus on China's foreign policy, cross-strait relations, maritime security, as well as ASEAN. Prior to joining RUSI, Verle Nguyen worked for the European External Action Service at the delegation of the European Union to Singapore. And in this role, she focused on EU-Singapore bilateral relations and Europe's role in Southeast Asia. So before um, I turn over to our speakers, just a few uh, disclaimers. I want to stress that the views expressed by the speakers, by myself as moderator, do not reflect the views and official positions of the US Department of State, the US Embassy in Singapore, or the United States government. All views and opinions expressed in this webinar also do not necessarily reflect the positions of the Pacific Forum uh, or of the speakers' home institutions. Finally, all remarks, including those during the question and answer portion, are on the record. And we are live, uh, not just through the Zoom platform, but also on Facebook. So please be uh, mindful of that. So without further ado, let me turn over to our guest speakers. Uh, first, uh, Professor Tan, Tan Si Tseng. Uh, the floor, the floor is yours, sirs. sir. Please limit your remarks to 10 to 12 minutes. Okay, well, thank you, David, for the very generous introduction. And let me begin with a word of thanks to the Pacific Forum for the invitation to participate in this series. 
uh, you know, over the past 20 years, I've, I've had many enjoyable, uh, fruitful collaborations with uh, many PEC Forum luminaries, uh, Ralph Kossa, Brett Glossman, and Carl Baker. But I think as far as I can recall, this is the very first PEC Forum event I've actually attended. Uh, but hey, b better late than never, right? So, okay, but the, the key point I want to make uh, uh, is, is really this. Singapore has made a very careful strategic choice to welcome, to encourage, to facilitate, and indeed even to justify America's forward presence in Asia. And in recent times, Singapore has continued to do this at risk of souring its relations with China in particular. And, and so you might ask, why bother, right? Uh, because as Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong uh, once noted during a visit uh, that he made to Washington DC back in 2007, and let me quote, he says, the landscape in Asia is changing, but America still plays a role which nobody else can play, holding the ring and fostering the stability of the region, enabling other countries to grow and prosper in a stable environment, unquote. So if anything, Singapore has I think in my view, doggedly held on to this belief in the, in the, the so-called indispensability of the United States as the region's quintessential balance, uh, particularly in the light of China's growing uh, might and, and, and reach, obviously. But it's fair to say that this belief has in recent times been tested like never before, uh, not simply because of President Trump's uh, China policy, but also China's assertiveness under President Xi's leadership. So let me flesh these points out a little bit more. Uh, first, in, in many ways, Singapore has gone beyond the pale to support the US presence in the region as David himself mentioned in his introductory remarks. And it's worth recalling that this wasn't always the case. Uh, in 1962, Lee Kuan Yew lamented America's replacing the British as the dominant power, uh, external power in Southeast Asia over what Lee saw at that time as very dubious US behavior uh, in, in, during the Indochina war in Laos in particular, including an attempt by the CIA to try to bribe Lee. So with his conviction uh, in the need for a stable balance of power, Lee nonetheless came to see the US as the only plausible balancer to the Soviets. And of course, when the Cold War ended uh, to the Chinese. Uh, and, and whatever priv private reservations Singapore's leaders may have held, about Mr. Trump's views and his policy conduct, you know, just go down the list, right? Uh, Anti-globalization, you know, uh, Mr. Trump's animus towards multilateralism, his withdrawing the US from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, his unfounded allegation that Singapore cheated on trade against the US. So Singapore has nonetheless rarely wavered from his support of the US strategic presence in Asia. And so for all intents and purposes, Singapore has been, been the US strongest and most reliable security partner in Southeast Asia. Again, a point that David has noted. So I, I won't go through the, the, the usual you know, category of listings of, of things that Singapore does uh, because this audience knows that uh, very, very well. But uh, let me just say that Singapore's relations with the US uh, have been described by President Obama uh, as a solid rock partnership. Uh, Ashton Carter once insisted that the US had no better friend uh, then Singapore in the region. And of course, Singapore hosted uh, the, uh, the first Trump Kim summit in June 2018, uh, which of course earned it Mr. Trump's effusive praise. And by the way, that event cost Singapore taxpayers 20 million bucks. So that's, that's a lot of money to pump into this relationship. Be that as it may, uh, not unlike most of Asia, uh, for a while now, Singapore has had China either as its top trading partner or number two, depending on the year uh, of, the, of the stats you're looking at. And this naturally puts Singapore in a very difficult spot, right? When it's asked by the Americans or by anyone else for that matter, to adopt a hardline stance against China. And so for this reason, Singapore uh, avoided openly backing the US's free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, even though, as we all know, Singapore strongly supports principles like freedom of navigation, rule of law, respect for sovereignty and open markets, all, all the very nice things that are promulgated in the FOIP strategy. And given the Trump administration's very hardline stance against Singapore, uh, Singapore's, uh, sorry, against China, uh, Singapore's concern, as my prime minister once put it, was the potential undesirable formation of rival blocks to manage China's rise. And so for that reason, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong 
has proposed that the Quad, for example, should become part of an inclusive and open regional architecture. And so here, here it bears reminded that when, when Singaporean leaders urge the need for a st stable balance of power, they're not at all thinking the containment of China, right? So not that at all. Lee Kuan Yew once lamented the proclivity of Chinese state-sponsored media to mistranslate his comments on balancing China to insinuate that he, Mr. Lee, Lee Kuan Yew, was advocating the containment of China. And that's simply not the case. Uh, some of you may remember Henry Kissinger once mused, right, that the United States global power, right, superpower, that the U.S. doesn't understand and cannot do a balance of power well. Why? Because it is so used to always setting the rules and calling the shots and so whereas balancing, at least in Kissinger's mind, given his work on the concept of Europe or his attempts to construct triangular diplomacy, balancing is in fact about co-managing international order and to the extent necessarily, indirectly sharing power. And perhaps the same could be said about the Chinese uh, either not grasping or indeed even rejecting the logics of balancing as well. But this is precisely what Singapore is arguing for. And Singapore is a small country living amongst giants, uh, hopes to see uh, this, this kind of a, a sharing arrangement. As, as, as Prime Minister Lee wrote in a June 2020 essay uh, in Foreign Affairs, and I quote, the status quo in Asia must change, but will the new configuration enable further success or bring dangerous instability? And that depends on the choices that the United States and China make separately and together. The two powers must work out a modus vivendi that will be competitive in some areas without allowing rivalry to poison cooperation in others, unquote. So I, I think it's, it's fair to say, right, at this stage, for all of its grandstanding, for all of its so-called wolf warrior diplomacy, China is probably in no position, nor does it have the stomach to take on global leadership and public goods providing that America has played pretty much since the, oh, the end of the Second World War, right? But assuming that power transition continues, room will nonetheless have to be made for China at the top. And granted, President Biden has made clear that he intends to get tough with China uh, but for Singapore, this isn't the issue as much as how the Biden administration can work out ways to collaborate with China without letting the competitive aspects of their relationship get in the way. And in that respect, I think Singapore will look for opportunities to work with both major powers to help foster US-China ties toward that, that end in ways that would nonetheless recognize the centrality of ASEAN and welcome the positive contributions of third parties like Singapore. In other words, no G2, please. Okay? Uh, and Singapore welcomes, therefore, Secretary of State Tony Blinken's assurance that a Biden-led America will, in fact, consult carefully with ASEAN where U.S. policy on Asia goes. Let me close by, by stating an obvious point. Singapore all said and done, Singapore marches to its own drumbeat. While it's highly supportive of the US, Singapore is at the end of the day, right, incorrigible hedger, an equal opportunity engager. And in that regard, the Singapore government seeks to balance principle with, with pragmatism. It doesn't always get that balance right, but it tries. And it has its own issues to deal with and, and therefore not everything that Singapore does can and should be understood within the rubric of the US-China dynamic. Uh, for example, Singapore declined President Bush's offer in 2004 to be a, a, a non-NATO major ally, a point that David had made uh, earlier on, not only because that could jeopardize Singapore's relationship with China, but equally its ties with its ASEAN neighbors with whom it has a very complicated history, like, like Indonesia, for example. And so Singapore tries to pick its battles carefully and, and this audience, I think of all, would remember quite, uh, quite well Singapore's reservations over Indonesia's early push for an ASEAN position on the Indo-Pacific in a very long drawn out process that led eventually to the release of ASEAN's outlook on the Indo-Pacific document. And Singapore's perceived stonewalling of that process 
uh, really got our Indonesian friends very, very upset. As such, it's, it's important for us to bear in mind that not every call that Singapore makes is either for the Americans or for the Chinese, uh, even though Singapore's penchant to engage with big powers may make it seem that way. And we may remember uh, in 2016, the arbitral tribunal's decision to deny Chinese claims to the South Chinese Seas and Singapore's support for that, for that call, that hugely complicated ties, uh, Singapore's ties with, with the Chinese. And, and despite not being a territorial claimant, right, Singapore did it because it believes in the need for big powers to exercise strategic restraint and responsibility. And so I recall back in, in 2014, fielding a call from, from a Russian military attache in Singapore who was visibly upset over Singapore's protesting of Russia's annexation of Crimea. And he got all upset. And I was like, duh, dude, <laughs> you know, come on. Right? For the same reason, in 2012, as part of the, the so-called Small Five, Singapore put forth a draft resolution before the UN General Assembly that called on the permanent five powers to, to refrain from using their veto power to block collective security council action in the prevention and halting of genocide and crimes against humanity. And, and unsurprisingly, the, the, the motion was squashed by the P5, but it was just a, a good indication of the lengths to which Singapore was prepared to go on behalf of small states. And so I think it is important for us to, to just bear in mind that that, that uh, this, is, this is the way Singapore conducts its foreign policy and sees uh, uh, its, uh, the, the point of view from, from its perch. So let, let me close. Singapore, uh, President Biden, uh, his promise to return America to international leadership and to the multilateral stage, that is all very, very highly welcome news as far as Singapore is concerned. Uh, but in a time when the term enablement has taken a negative connotation in Washington, especially Singapore for its own reasons will remain an enabler of the US strategic presence in Asia in the hope that that will restore stability to the region rather than prolong discord in it. So let me stop here. And again, I thank you for this time. Thank you, Professor, for this great kickoff. Uh, let me turn uh, the floor over to Viola. Viola, over to you. Thank you so much, David, and thank you to Pacific Forum for having me um, here today, um, calling from London, um, and to Professor Tan for this really fascinating insight into Singaporean thinking uh, about the bilateral relationship with the United States um, in the region. I thought I would um, give a little bit more of a flavor as to what that bilateral relationship is in defense terms, particularly looking at the maritime domain, simply because I hope that also people from Europe uh, will be listening to the recording um, later on uh, once it's out. Um, so do forgive me to everyone who is uh, with us today who already knows this, um, but I hope um, it'll be of interest nonetheless. So, I mean, from where I am sitting here in Europe, um, the Indo-Pacific, uh, whenever you discuss it, it really does very quickly turn into a discussion uh, about the maritime domain and maritime security uh, and of Southeast Asia. And if you take that a little further, it very quickly boils down to a few key countries, uh, namely the role of Singapore and the United States. Those two are almost always uh, discussed uh, as the, at the top of the list. Um, and I don't think this is really surprising. Uh, if we look at just the, the evolution of the strategic partnership between Singapore and the United States, I mean, one that is uh, over 50 years, um, a longstanding one and extremely expansive, as has already been said, um, you know, you'll find across the board uh, against uh, a numerous policy portfolios, a wealth of cooperation and expertise between the two. And really defense cooperation is just no different. Um, so, you know, harking back to 1990 with the bilateral agreement, the MOU, um, then to 2005 when in the strategic framework agreement, the United States already designated Singapore as a major security cooperation partner. Um, and then in 2015, the two sides um, enhanced their bilateral relationship 
um, in defense cooperation to include newer areas like uh, humanitarian aid and disaster relief, uh, cyber defense and biosecurity, all of high relevance today, as we all know. Um, and that really builds on a very um, solid foundation of defense cooperation in uh, border security, maritime um, security more generally, counterterrorism, proliferation, um, military uh, preparedness, you name it. Um, and then, of course, in 2019, the two countries uh, renewed their bilateral relationship, that MOU that was signed back in 1990, to allow the U.S. continued use of air and naval bases in Singapore, as well as provision of logistical support for transiting personnel, aircraft, and vessels for exercises, refueling, and maintenance. Now, Singapore was also the only country um, in the region to contribute assets and personnel to the global coalition to defeat ISIS. So this is in no means uh, a collaboration and a cooperative relationship that only extends to its immediate region. And in 2018, Singapore also served as commander of the Gulf of Aden Counter Piracy Task uh, Combined Task Force 151. So in the maritime domain specifically, really the two countries have um, an extensive uh, and consistent uh, routine of exercise and training to really ensure interoperability between the two, whether that be bilaterally um, across the three um, armed services or multilaterally, be it uh, in the US ASEAN exercises um, or in the rim of the Pacific exercise, but also beyond Navy to Navy exercises, also Coast Guard cooperation uh, training and exercising as well, um, whether that be in CCAT or Simli. So why is this? Why is this relationship so strong? I mean, we've already had, I think, quite a, an interesting insight from Professor Tan, um, but I would start um, my analysis uh, a bit more recent, um, namely the US pivot uh, under Obama for all its criticisms, of course. Um, we've seen that move from a pivot to Asia Pacific to now a strategy in the Indo-Pacific. And the importance of the relationship with Singapore has really only grown. I mean, Southeast Asia geographically, of course, lies at the heart of this combined region of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And the Indo-Pacific has, of course, also been designated the central theater of command for the US maritime strategy, as well as the priority theater for US foreign policy more generally. And so the economic and strategic value of the Indo-Pacific, I think, is not difficult to understand either. Um, according to the UN Conference uh, on Trade and Development, a third of the world's sea trade goes through the South China Sea. 70% um, of the world's maritime traffic passes through the Indian Ocean. 30% um, of the global maritime crude oil trade passes through the South China Sea. And 90% of that goes through the Strait of Malacca choke points. And of course, many countries uh, and their economies and livelihoods depend on sea lines of communication that run through this region. And that really includes China too. So 60% of Chinese trade and value is via sea and a great deal of that goes through the South China Sea. Um, and Singapore, not you know, to forget, has the world's bus busiest uh, port in terms of uh, shipping tonnage. So um, it's no wonder then that I think we continue to see, and in some cases increasingly see, the potential for instability in this region, uh, and particularly in the maritime domain. Uh, this includes non-state maritime security concerns, um, whether that be pollution, the effects of climate change, illegal fishing, or piracy and armed robbery at sea. And I think just looking at IEU fishing uh, in particular, you know, the UN estimates that the value of IU fishing globally is uh, yearly at around 23 uh, billion US dollars. Um, China is the chief offender here, but there are numerous other countries that are involved in this uh, trade and practice. Um, according to CSIS estimates, fish stocks in the South China Sea may have fallen between 70 and 95% since the 1950s, and catch rates have dropped potentially uh, between 66 and 75% just in the past 20 years. Um, so this has had an effect not just on large scale fisheries industries in the region, but really on everyday livelihoods for coastal communities and for the primary, um, and for those whose uh, primary source of uh, protein really is um, from fish. So the complexity of such issues, I think is further compounded by the competition that we see playing out over the maritime territory in the region. Fishing vessels, after all, are not just saturating the waters of the South China Sea um, to catch fish, um, but they're also there to claim and hold territory. Uh, the growing competition between states vying for space 
uh, or to prevent for further control of it by others, uh, and the potential risk that this carries for miscommunication or purposeful clashes uh, remains a serious issue, not just for states in the region, but really for all states dependent on these vital waterways, uh, whether in Asia or outside of it. And it's so therefore, um, I think deeply worrying that when we look at you know, the latest Chinese Coast Guard law that's been passed, um, and of course, China has the largest Coast Guard in the world, um, it authorizes its maritime law enforcers to demolish foreign constructions on what it considers Chinese claimed reefs and allows the use of weapons against foreign ships. It also um, gives the right to set up exclusion zones to board, search, detain, and expel foreign vessels and arrest individuals suspected of seriously violating Chinese laws in the waters under the Chinese jurisdiction. And of course, this covers a great deal of the South China Sea. So, you know, for all the conversation around um, great powers needing to find ways to cooperate, there are some serious obstacles here um, that will be very difficult uh, to overcome, particularly when they're written into law. Um, and so I think, you know, the, Sing the United States and Singapore really um, to a large extent, share an understanding of the fragility of the security landscape in uh, Southeast Asia and in the Indo-Pacific. Um, they have an appreciation of and support for the rules-based international system and the rule of law, um, and the notion that might doesn't make rights and that countries deserve and indeed um, have a right to their own strategic autonomy. Um, so I think there's a great deal of opportunity to further extend this uh, cooperative relationship and this strategic partnership um, into the challenges that we see evolving um, in today's uh, security landscape. But there are also some serious challenges. Um, I'll name a few. Uh, I think firstly, there is absolutely a need to restore faith uh, in the US commitment to the Indo-Pacific and particularly Southeast Asia uh, as a subregion to that. Um, you know, not having the United States present at a top level uh, to these summits for years in a row um, does not do wonders for your reputation, your credibility in um, signaling how seriously you take this region uh, and uh, its future. Um, in the US's 2018 National Defense Strategy, it states that when we pool resources and share responsibility for our common defense, our security becomes, uh, our security burden becomes lighter. And I think countries in the region over the past couple of years have maybe felt that their security burden has become heavier uh, with the absence of the United States uh, engaging diplomatically, multilaterally, uh, and being visible um, beyond, obviously, a subset of, of different activities um, in this region specifically. And I think the easiest way forward is to really speak up and show up. Um, that means bilaterally, and I think Secretary Blinken has done a great job uh, of signaling that already, um, you know, reaching out to uh, treaty allies in, uh, in Asia, but also um, to Thailand uh, and, and other countries. And of course, Singapore um, will, you know, be very shortly on that list if, if it hasn't been contacted already. Um, having an ambassador to Singapore will help. Um, but also engaging in those multilateral fora and making sure that when you say ASEAN centrality matters, you actually back that up uh, with various initiatives and engagements. I think secondly, um, extending the focus of uh, maritime security uh, even more in Southeast Asia, but also across the Indo-Pacific um, into non-traditional security areas would be very um, beneficial. Uh, and that in doing so, it, there should really be a focus on whole of government approaches uh, when considering uh, capacity building in countries. Um, I think Blake Herzinger has already uh, written extensively on uh, the potential for Coast Guards, US Coast Guards uh, to be uh, deployed uh, and more actively involved uh, in uh, the Indo-Pacific. And I would support that idea. And I think the United States has signaled that it will um, extend shiprider agreements. So that's certainly a good start. Um, but I think also um, there needs to be a, a look at, I think, how you can fight that um, very pervasive maritime crime problem uh, across the Indo-Pacific that really connects coast to coast uh, and is not just, you know, contained to little subregions. Um, so understanding the links between uh, various subregions of the Indo-Pacific and how maritime crime functions. But then also um, within countries and within, uh, within uh, subregions, 
focusing on that land sea nexus uh, will be vital as well. Um, because it's not just about training maritime law enforcement, uh, it's also about training the judiciary, ministries of labor and the environment all around the same problems. It's really about fostering, I think, an all of government approach to protect, for example, the marine environment, regulate its use sustainably, offer security and stability to those employed uh, in related industries uh, to make sure that they don't fall prey to modern slavery, for example, in the fishing uh, industry. Um, and it's also about helping officials understand uh, the relevant legislation in place to be able to identify uh, transgressions and to uh, prosecute them successfully. And given Singapore's own strength in maritime protection and security, I think this is probably an area um, where the US and Singapore can uh, find further areas of uh, cooperation. I think thirdly, working together on um, a, a greater discussion on global governance norms when it comes to uh, the maritime domain is another area where um, I think we're seeing new challenges and uh, where we, I think, need a more doubling down uh, of efforts to, to discuss them. So uh, that means you know, global governance vis-a-vis uh, -vis resource exploitation versus conservation in the uh, maritime domain, whether that be in the seabed or in uh, the polar regions, um, global norms uh, as prescribed in UNCLOS, um, but then how they relate to new technology in the maritime domain uh, for which they don't necessarily account. And then also, of course, climate change um, and its impact on the maritime domain in coastal states. Um, Fourthly, uh, second to last, um, working with additional partners, as everybody knows, hopefully um, many European countries, chiefly France, uh, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, uh, but also the UK are reorienting themselves towards the Indo-Pacific. Um, a lot of them focus on uh, ASEAN centrality. A lot of them include a mention of Singapore and the United States, um, and of course, a desire to work uh, on maritime security. And I think there's a lot of synergy to be leveraged there. Uh, by Singapore and the United States. And then finally, um, just to return to the point on China, I think managing expectations around you know, how to deal with China, what great power competition uh, and uh, some sort of a coexistence between China and the United States looks like will be required because as it stands, it does really look like there's still um, uh, an immense amount of disparity between what Southeast Asian countries and even potentially Singapore Think of the United States, want of the United States vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, and the same goes, of course, um, for what they want and think of China as well. And I think that recognition or that understanding between Southeast Asian countries and the United States needs to come closer together uh, for there to really be uh, some sort of a coexistence uh, in the future. But I'll leave it at that and um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you both for excellent presentations. Um, let's move on to the Q&A session. I think you should soon see uh, on the screen instructions um, about how to proceed for the Q&A. Um, to ask a question or make a comment, you can either choose to use the raise hand function, which is located on the participants tab at the bottom of the, the, Zoom, the Zoom screen. Uh, please wait to be called and, and uh, unmuted by Pacific Forum staff before speaking. Uh, and please also state your name, position, and affiliation before commenting or asking question, questions. Alternatively, you can also post your question on the Q&A tab. But if you're going to use the Q&A tab, please also identify yourself by stating your name and, and affiliation. I'll try to uh, do my best to uh, ask as many questions um, as possible. Um, I have questions on my own, but I would rather go straight to the uh, audience if I see questions, I already see questions actually. Uh, let me get, go straight to the, to the audience. Um, so uh, this is a question for, from um, Ravi Vel Velour. Uh, what do you reckon are the chances uh, of the US under Biden uh, setting up a new Indian Ocean fleet and where would it be located? And uh, Ravi is associated editor uh, at the Strait Times. Go ahead, you know, if you, if you want to take, take that one on. 
Should I just, I can um, answer? Well, I think um, obviously uh, the, the idea of a first fleet was floated um, uh, towards the end of the Trump uh, administration um, and uh, Singapore was mentioned as a potential uh, location for it, um, as a permanent location for it uh, in India for that matter as well. Um, it doesn't seem that there had been much coordination or cons consultation uh, in the lead up to that announcement um, being public and being made public. So, um, you know, a clarification, I think, was given from all sides that um, at least from the US opinion now, um, it seemed to be at least for now an expeditionary force and potentially, um, you know, we might see this uh, in the future. Um, but in terms of where it might be located uh, later on, I think um, Western Australia has been floated um, as a, a potential location, given uh, that it's a nice place to go, um, but also easy access uh, to the Indian Ocean region more generally. Professor Tan, do you want to add something to this? No, no, that, that was a, that's a fabulous answer, so, so I'm fine. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, I have uh, Ralph Koss, uh, uh, President Emeritus from Pacific Forum, uh, who wants the floor. Uh, I'll ask the Pacific Forum staff to please um, unmute him. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Yes. Good. Uh, hi, thanks to both of you, Sei Seng. Great to see you again. Uh, I would expect that one of the holdover uh, initiatives from uh, the Trump administration uh, to Biden is going to be the Quad and the Quad Plus. Uh, they may rename it, but uh, something along those lines, something that promotes uh, freedom of navigation, uh, rule of law, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, things that you know won't say they're against China, but certainly the Chinese will, will read it that way. Uh, assuming that this kind of, you know, League of Democracies, which hopefully won't be called League of Democracies, uh, is being put together, do you see Singapore joining it? Thanks. Thank you, Ralph. That's a, that's a, that's a challenging question. I think Singapore um, obviously was involved in, in the uh, one original Malabar exercises uh, when the Quad uh, uh, you know, uh, as an incarnation of the Quad uh, uh, began to take shape. Uh, but I think given the, the obvious potential reactions from the Chinese, um, you know, I think Singapore would be, would be nonplus to, 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 to jump, you know, with both feet uh, into such a, an opportunity. Uh, but that being said, I think, uh, uh, as I mentioned in my comments, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Lung has, has made much of the fact that as he, as he sees it, uh, the quad, the quad plus, you know, could be something that could be um, embedded, if you will, nested within uh, the broader regional architecture, much more inclusive architecture. So I think uh, going in this direction with the quad plus, it's it's a very positive um, um, direction, and to the extent that it could grow and expand, uh, and again, you know, one one asks, one begs the question, right? You know, you you don't want to expand too much. Uh, to the point it becomes irrelevant. Uh, but I think if it were to go in that positive, inclusive direction, uh, that could be something that I, I would imagine Singapore wouldn't, wouldn't be, be uh, opposed to participating in it. Again, particularly if it doesn't adopt a strong anti-China slant. Maybe just to add to that, um, if I may, David, I, I agree. I, I do think that there would be a slight hesitation and I certainly don't expect Singapore to be the next country to join or sign on to the quad. So if we're looking at an extended quad plus, I would imagine um, you know, there's discussions around whether the UK, for example, will sign on or um, European uh, countries, whether they might uh, join in. Um, but um, I think when it comes to Singapore, the question is, again, um, as I think Professor uh, said, um, it needs to be inclusive, but at what point do you reach that threshold at which Singapore would be comfortable to join? You know, who would need to join? What would the framing of that need to be? Um, and I think we're not quite there. <laughs> we're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that answers one of my questions, which is, which was, 
um, you know, when does the United States ask too much? And it sounds from both of your answers that, you know, the quad, at least in, in, its, in its form, could be actually a red line. Um, so I got lots of questions. Let me try and uh, try and combine two. Uh, so the first one, uh, they're related. So the first one is from uh, Matt Merigi, uh, one of the young leaders from the US and an employee of the US DOD, Department of Defense. Uh, it's a question uh, specifically for Professor Tan. Uh, can the United States remain an effective balancer now that China's military technology development is accelerating, or is that balancing capability under threat? Mm. So this is the first part of the question. Second question mm. from Matt Livers uh, from the STMA Global Studies Educator. Are there any efforts that are being made by the United States with the help of Singapore to develop more regional agreements or cooperation with other countries, particularly Vietnam and, and uh, or India? So there you go, maybe hey. Professor Tom might All right. go well, first. Thank, thank, yeah, thank you for those, those uh, uh, very good questions. Can the US remain an effective balancer? Um, I think we have seen some challenges, right? Uh, I think, uh, and, and, and Birla in, in, in her comments earlier on, you know, um, I made allusion to the fact that that the the even the Obama pivot, you know, wasn't as robust as it could have been. Uh, so I think there are these big questions uh, uh, about the effectiveness of, of of the U.S. in terms of its balancing role. My sense is that balancing is is something that goes well beyond just the military uh, um, side of the, the shop, the dimension, uh, involves political balancing, involves uh, economic balancing, a whole series of, of, of strategies. And, and here I, I uh, uh, just wanna uh, uh, reiterate Viola's comment that you know, the, the US in terms of its diplomatic political role in, in not being present in the region uh, over the past four years, that's something that uh, is is rather unfortunate, um, and 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 that I to, to to my mind that's part and parcel of an all encompassing uh, strategy of balancing. So that's that's one one side of of I think the the, uh, the 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 response. The other side is 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 the fact that and, and here I go back to my comments earlier. Right there there is a conceptual difference between balancing and and, and containment. And the unfortunate thing is that uh, the way uh, I think American strategy has been presented over the past several years, uh, it's, it's fallen on, on the containment side uh, rather than, than, than balancing. And so I think uh, one will have to go back to redo our homework <laughs> as to what balancing really constitutes and be able to exercise that in, in a reasonably sufficient and effective way. Maybe there, there just was, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No. 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 Go ahead. Uh, well, so I was going to ask you, Professor, if you want to take on also the portion of the question that included the interest in the United States and Singapore engaging other countries, particularly Vietnam and, and India. Yeah. Yeah. Just just a quick one before uh, before we, we we give space to Viola to to comment. Um, I, I think there. At this point in time, there are um, ongoing, uh, at least uh, that I'm aware of, you know, ongoing uh, attempts at at least 1.5 track level uh, in in engaging uh, on a kind of a, a um, you know not just bilateral but but tri and, and multilateral minilateral uh, kinds of arrangements uh, that could potentially emerge uh, that could see um, I, I guess um, the U.S. and Singapore and potentially uh, you know uh, I think very proactive partners like like Vietnam. Uh, and, and targeted, I think, at specific uh, issues. And, and here, I think uh, one, one raises the possibility, one has to raise the possibility of whether one might see a kind of an, uh, oh, you know, call it whatever you will, right, ASEAN minus uh, approach to maritime security, for example. Uh, I see that there are prospects of, of that, um, 
Uh, I think at this point in time, nothing has emerged just yet in part because of the concern, again, uh, that the Chinese may, may not take this exceptionally well and push back against that. But uh, I think the, the, the space is there uh, for that kind of a possibility emerging. On, you mentioned maritime issues specifically. For, for I, would, I would think so, yes, absolutely, the South China Sea in particular. Thank you, Veronica. Um, maybe if I could just quickly um, say something about the whole balancing question. I think, you know, I think that's absolutely right with um, what was already said around um, needing a, a kind of holistic approach to your policy in order to have an effective balancing role. But I would also add to that, that it needs to be probably proactive rather than reactive. And I think what we've seen um, recently uh, over the last couple of years is um, more of a reactive policy to try and, you know, match China uh, on everything. And that's, um, I, not, I don't think that that's necessarily an effective balance or role. Um, you will never be able to catch up on everything. So I think there needs to be a stronger assessment and a reassessment of what the United States can proactively do to try and put China on the back foot. Um, you know, and it's not, as, as Professor Tan said, only a, a game of um, comparing uh, platforms and, and, um, and military assets. Um, it's more than that. And I, I, in that point and in that light, I would add one other thing that China, of course, doesn't have, and that is allies, um, which the United States does. It has a very strong network in, of allies. And looking at the Quad, you know, something that fell apart in, in its first iteration um, is growing in strength um, slowly but surely. And we might not see this be formalized yet, but um, I think those sorts of relationships uh, gaining ground is something that, you know, is at the end of the day, worrying to China. Um, so understanding what your leverage points are, what your partners want, and proactively pursuing such an agenda is really required, I think, to be an effective balancer. Just on the point of um, India and Vietnam, absolutely. I think India in this uh, declassified uh, Indo-Pacific strategy was given quite a lot of prominence, and it's clearly seen as, um, you know, an incredibly important um, anchor in the Indo-Pacific uh, that uh, I think from an American point of view, um, should be uh, growing in strength um, uh, as a contributor to regional security. Um, so I think expect a, a continuation of that. Um, and the same goes for Vietnam. Um, you know, I think over the past couple of years, the number of interactions that we've seen, the fact that you know Singapore was mentioned for the for um, the uh, uh, summit, but Vietnam had uh, the second iteration of the uh, Kim summit. So um, I think Vietnam uh, likewise uh, is, is a partner growing in strength. And I would agree that the maritime domain is in maritime security is one area where you will see uh, mini lateralism uh, initiatives, I think, gain ground. But I would also say that, you know, cooperation on new technology, on trade, um, those are all areas where I think um, you know there are there is space for an evolution in, in the relationship. Thank you very much. Let me. I got a a long list of question questions, which is great. But I'm I'm going to try to get them all in. Um, let me turn to Charlie Brown. Um, please allow him to speak. Um, all right. Sorry. I think you can you can speak now. Hi. Right, thanks. Greetings from Singapore. Um, looking ahead uh, this year, there's two important summits in Singapore, the World Economic Forum in May and the Shangri-La Dialogue in June. Um, wondering what uh, messages we anticipate from the new Biden administration for them to put out, but also what is the message that Singapore and the region would like to hear? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Berla, do you want to go first this time? Sure. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the most likely uh, messages is that the United States is back at the table um, and is re-engaging with partners and, and allies alike in the region. I think that's quite an obvious point that has already been stre stressed, uh, I think, in numerous different um, uh, messages already given from uh, the new administration uh, and by observers alike. Um, and I expect that to be uh, the case as well uh, in these forums. Um, I do think, though, that, um, you know, offering a um, message of consistency um, will probably be important as well, and I expect that to be the case, um, to really re-engaging in multilateralism, uh, too. But I think um, potentially having, um, you know, I think 
there will be a need, and that's probably, I think, um, realized as well, that there needs to be um, a recognition of the challenges that uh, the region faces too. So, you know, it's not all, um, it's not all uh, cozy and nice. There are some real challenges that need to be uh, addressed uh, and some of them do involve China. So whilst I don't expect, you know, an, an incredibly um, bombastic tone, I, I do think uh, some sort of a measured recognition that there are serious uh, issues um, up ahead uh, to, that that will be included. Um, and then finally, I think as well, um, when it comes to uh, the Biden administration um, and what the region wants from it, I mean, I think, <laughs> I think that's a really difficult question because it, it does seem to depend really on the issue at hand uh, and the country that you're looking uh, at uh, and, and considering. Um, but certainly at least those kind of core issues that I've just um, mentioned, I, I think will generally be shared uh, by many, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave, hand it over to Professor Tan because he probably knows better than I do on this. Far, far from it. Uh, I think, but just to add to what has been said, I think one of the interesting things for me would be to see how the Shangri-La dialogue develops in the coming years. And, and, and this audience would remember that in recent times, uh, the, the dialogue has been seen particularly by the Chinese as essentially a platform that is used to essentially condemn and, 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 and to criticize the Chinese. And it's not just the Trump administration, right? We, we think back to the Obama years as well. So it'll be interesting to see how the Biden administration uh, plays its card um, and, and, and uh, what kinds of a, of a messaging it wants to, to provide. Um, and I think for, for as far as Singapore is concerned, uh, you know, the, plat the, 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 the dialogue was used, uh, ha has been, has been used by Singapore, I think in many respects as a place for, uh, you know, where it can demonstrate convening power uh, and bring the major powers uh, to the table. Uh, but that being said, you know, if you've got the Chinese being upset and so on and so forth, then, then it, it doesn't really serve its purpose. So, so I think uh, the, it, you, you, we've, we've got to see, I think some level of, of, of conciliation as well as openness on both sides uh, to make that uh, actually work. Thank you, Professor. Um, let me combine two questions. Um, one from Andrew Carroll, who's uh, working on um, WMD deterrence and non-proliferation as a, as a fellow at the Young Professionals in Foreign Policy. And the question is, what role, if any, should EU states and the UK in particular play in, in, in bolstering US Singapore defense activities in Southeast Asia, especially in light of talks of Euro European strategic autonomy and, and um, the recent NATO 2030 expert uh, report. So that's the first part of the question. Uh, I wanna sort of include another question by Noor Lastrina Hamid, who's a young leader from Singapore. And the question is, uh, it's actually specifically to you, Verle, it's uh, on the point you made about climate change and the maritime uh, impact of, of climate change. The question is with developments in the Arctic and China's maritime Silk Road initiative, what are your comments on, on the impact of, uh, for, for Singapore? So one, one question on, I guess, non-proliferation and one on, on climate change specifically and how, how that relates to Singapore. And, and the, the possibility of US Singapore cooperation. Um, so, I mean, they're both very good questions. Um, very quick addition to my previous comment and to Charlie, I think in WEF, I would be really interested to know what the Biden administration's comments are around not being part of RCEP or T uh, CPTPP are. Um, just uh, wanted to add that on very quickly. Um, on these two excellent questions, I mean, what is the role that the UK can play? Look, I think um, the UK has made it very clear that um, it is going to uh, embark on its own Indo-Pacific tilt. Um, the UK uh, transatlantic relationship with US is, you know, a cornerstone for uh, the UK's own security, and so that relationship is also, you know, very often um, said to be one of a special relationship. Um, I don't expect that to uh, change uh, now that Brexit has occurred, and in fact, it might. Um, only deepen. 
Um, and I think when it comes to, uh, you know, maritime security, in any case, in the Indo-Pacific, the UK will be sending an aircraft carrier later uh, this year sometime. Uh, and it's already been noted that um, American F-35s will be on board. I expect it to probably dock uh, in Singapore um, when it transits through the region, but there is no, we haven't heard yet necessarily what the route will be. Um, but, you know, the UK and Singapore itself have a long, long history, uh, a long standing relationship of cooperation, including in um, various uh, areas of security uh, cooperation, um, maritime security being just one. Um, so I think it's a it's a natural fit. Um, the question again will be, you know, what is the orientation around China? What is uh, the activities that these countries will be doing, um, particularly the US uh, and the UK, which you know, clearly have a stance uh, on phone ops, uh, potentially in the South China Sea, um, uh, as being of, of interest, or at least uh, a shared, um, I should say, a shared uh, strong will to uphold UNCLOS uh, in, in around the world. Um, so how uh, Singapore fits into that, I think, will remain to be seen. But, you know, there are numerous ways in which security cooperation can take place. And it doesn't necessarily only need to be um, around one specific issue like maritime security. Um, and then in terms of um, the climate change question, um, I think there's a couple of different uh, I think angles to this. Um, you mentioned uh, the Arctic and the Maritime Silk Road. I mean, the Maritime Silk Road is global. Um, there are obviously challenges in Chinese uh, sustainability of, um, of infrastructure. Um, it is clearly interested in building infrastructure in the Arctic. What I think would be more um, interesting to focus on, particularly, I guess, in impacting Singapore is that Singapore is also an observer of the Arctic Council, um, as China is. Um, China has so far, um, you know, tried to get, I think, more of a role uh, in the Arctic to work together on, on norms. Um, it has signed on to the fisheries ban. Um, but it clearly wants to set help set uh, the agenda in the future. Um, that is, uh, I think, a wider uh, ambition uh, in the maritime kind of global governance um, portfolio of China or ambition of China. So the Arctic is part and parcel of that. And if it does uh, help or start to set standards in the maritime domain, that will certainly be uh, of, uh, of relevance to Singapore, uh, given its own a geographic situation, um, but also its own interest in, uh, in international shipping uh, and other maritime industries. I think just to add to, to what's been said already um, and very said very well, in fact, uh, is, is uh, the, the, the potential for um, uh, you know, multilateral cooperation vis-a-vis -vis COVID, um, the pandemic. Uh, you know, we have seen uh, the European countries' relationships with China deteriorate as a result of this. Uh, because of, of uh, you know, accusations flowing back and forth. Uh, you know, the US hasn't really performed very well in this regard as well. Uh, but what are the possibilities that, that we could be seen in terms of, 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 of just encouraging and facilitating cooperation uh, in dealing with the global pandemic? I think that's one area uh, that uh, I, I certainly hopefully would, would we'll see uh, you know, grow and emerge. Thank you very much. Uh, let me now turn to John Barnett. Um, please allow him to speak. Go ahead, sir, you, the, the floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Dr. John Barnett, um, uh, Professor of Political Science, Emporia State University, and in, in a very cold state called Kansas right now. Um, and so um, my question is, and I'm a little perplexed, I've been to Vietnam um, five times since 1992. And um, um, one of the things I've, I've always dealt with with ASEAN, and ASEAN has been a, a fairly good deterrent, at least I thought for China, um, but also ASEAN was, was very good for um, expanding cooperation uh, within the region. Um, can ASEAN come back and, 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 um, and, and, and have promote cooperation within the region, including China? And now that the US is hopefully back on the scene, that, that would also be part of that as well. My other question is, 
When I've been in Vietnam, I've heard rumors before that the U.S. would be welcome into Cameron Bay and to Da Nang, and I'm curious, um, has anyone heard about that? And would that be a better position for the U.S. to be in to, uh, to, uh, to promote uh, maritime security, also maybe um, enforcing um, fishing rules and regulations within the area, cooperating with other um, uh, countries in the area? So that, those are my two questions. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, Professor, yeah. do you want to take that one first? Thank you. Uh, let, let me take a stab at the question about ASEAN cooperation. Uh, can, can ASEAN promote cooperation? Oh, certainly, yes. That's, that's a clear-cut uh, uh, answer. Uh, I think the big question for me is, is what, the, what, what the, the perceived role the U.S. is with regards to to uh, regional cooperation in part because as, as we know full well, you know, the Trump administration uh, essentially disengaged from the region in, in, in such a fashion, uh, particularly with regards to regional frameworks and, and so on and so forth. We think of the, the, the TPP obviously, but, but a couple of other things as well. Uh, so the question then is in the light of, of ongoing developments in the region, uh, and here I think of particularly of the the, the R set has already been mentioned, and China is very much a part of that, um, uh, and things of that sort. So, what can the U.S. do to reconnect, as it were, with the region? Uh, now, let's be clear. You know, the United States, uh, uh, even though it's 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 pulled out of of, of participating in, in many of these kinds of frameworks, nonetheless, the U.S. still remains very much engaged uh, bilaterally in the region. And so uh, it's, it still remains uh, possible that the U.S. can do a, a heck of a lot of good in, in the region, uh, despite its, its, its non-involvement in some of these things. But, but I think it's, it's, it's a really an, an, you know, an open door situation right now as far as, as, as uh, the Biden administration um, uh, re-engaging with the region, not just bilaterally, but I think in, in a multilateral fashion as well. Indeed, uh, if indeed that's what... Mr. Biden himself has been saying, then, uh, you know, I think it's a wait and see game at this point in time. Thank you. Uh, Berla, do you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, maybe in terms of just the ASEAN question, um, you know, I think, um, I think ASEAN does facilitate cooperation. Um, the, the problem is that it's not necessarily the pace that others would like. Um, and that, uh, evolution, unfortunately, takes time and, and baby steps are uh, usually the way forward uh, within ASEAN. So, you know, I would, I would note that um, there was a greater support for the, I, the Our Eyes uh, initiative, uh, for example, on intelligence uh, sharing for counterterrorism, um, combating uh, terrorism in, in the region. So, you know, again, these are slow moving, um, small progressions uh, that I wouldn't necessarily discount. Um, but at this, in the meantime, and at the same time, parallel to that, you can have, you know, initiatives of minilateral um, groupings uh, of countries who um, might be further ahead and more comfortable in taking further steps in defense and security cooperation. And we've seen that on numerous occasions uh, within ASEAN and Southeast Asia, more generally um, amongst the 10 states. Um, so, you know, variations thereof, I think, will continue to evolve. Um, but it'll be important to have them in parallel and not uh, as a replacement to ASEAN. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, we actually, so, um, we don't have much time left. So let me try and, and add two more questions. Um, one by Ankush Wago. Uh, Please allow him to, to talk. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Ankush. I'm a Pacific Forum Young Leader from Singapore and currently studying at the Lee Kuan Yew School here at NUS. Uh, thank you to both the presenters for your presentations. Uh, my question is on something that was alluded to briefly, I think, by Mr. Santoro and also something that I think uh, Ms. Nowens mentioned in her presentation, uh, which is about sort of the burden sharing aspect of the relationship uh, between the United States and ASEAN. So I think in the national security strategy in 2018, there was a specific sort of line about uh, partners for the United States stepping up and sort of uh, taking their share of the burden. And I think uh, there was a sort of perception that this was viewed 
in the Trump administration context as sort of the transactional side of the of partners who have not traditionally done enough uh, stepping up to the plate. So now with the Biden administration coming in, I just wanted to ask, uh, do you foresee that this is something that would continue uh, in that the United States would sort of continue this line of thought in requiring partners to do more or perhaps show more intent? Thank you. So, I mean, you, you, you directed the question partly to me. I, I, will, I will tell you personally that yes, the answer is yes. Uh, and I will, uh, would also add uh, that uh, the previous administration, the Obama administration, was also talking about burden sharing and division of labor and so on and so forth. So this is something that I absolutely expect to uh, remain the case. I think uh, my own view is that, as, as our speakers uh, ha have mentioned, is that um, the, the Biden team is going to be is going to have what I call an ally, allies first policy, and and I the, my definition of allies is really broader than just treaty allies. It includes partners as well, and in addition to this, and again as our speakers have mentioned, uh, multilateralism will be key to that approach. So, you know that 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 means that the United States will be leaning in, but at the same time also expects. Uh, we'll also expect its its allies, partners, to to take on uh, a greater share of the burden, so so to speak. But I'll I'll let our speaker add, um, you know, yeah. comments about this. And I think uh, this will be the last question because we, we we're running out of time. Yeah. Uh, I think David is absolutely correct. You know, burden sharing goes back to the Nixon administration and all the way through. Um, and I, but I, I think the the point that was made by 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 the uh, the. The, the question uh, regarding transactionalism, I think, is a very crucial one. Uh, I do see, and I, well, in fact, I do hope that under the Biden administration, uh, you know, things would become less transactional. Um, and and just from from the uh, the my sense of of, of what uh, Mr. Biden himself has already said thus far, and, and what uh, Secretary Blinken have said, uh, I, I I tick, uh, you know, hard in the fact that uh, I I do believe that the relationship will become less transactional. Um, and I think that's be a key development in moving relations forward. Just to add to that, um, I fully agree with uh, David and Professor John. Um, I would say um, that, you know, Again, um, to reiterate that burden sharing is not new. The call for burden sharing is not new. Nobody can be everywhere all the time, all at once doing everything. So, you know, it is just a logical um, evolution uh, of, I think, partnerships and foreign policy in today's uh, world to meet all the numerous challenges that we do uh, in this complex security environment. Um, however, it, I don't think, as has already been said, it will be matched with or coupled with an America first policy, uh, that sense of transactionalism that was felt. Um, but potentially also, I wonder, you know, to what extent that ideological tinge that we saw in the Trump administration um, really evolved towards the end as well, um, whether that will be employed. And, and I think not. Um, you know, I think some, some comments that were made, for example, by Pompeo um, around communism, um, deeply unhelpful when one of your countries, uh, partner countries that you're seeking to cooperate with more uh, is Vietnam. Um, so I think that kind of ideological aspect to um, foreign policy, uh, I think, uh, again, is something that um, probably will change. Thank you so much. Um, Unfortunately, we're out of time. I realize that I haven't gone through all the questions and I apologize for this. There's a lot on the table. Obviously, we are not going to solve the, all the problems we have in uh, you know, 75 minutes. But I want to I wanna thank uh, our speakers uh, for excellent presentations and everyone in the audience as, as well. Uh, Verla, thank you in particular for waking up because I think it's uh, past 2 a.m. where you are. So. Thank you for, for staying up. Um, everyone, please stay tuned for the third edition of our US Singapore Indo-Pacific Conversation Series, which will take place in February and will be co-organized by the American Chamber of Commerce, Singapore. And the third session will explore economic and trade issues in Asia and what it means for, you, for the US-Singapore partnership. 
Also, I, I would like everyone to be aware that uh, we at the Pacific Forum run similar sessions with other partners, including Vietnam, the Philippines. And in fact, we will have our first uh, session um, with Australia next week on February 2nd, and it'll focus on the future of the US-Australia alliance in the Indo-Pacific. So with that, thanks again to our speakers. Thank you, everyone. And I hope to see you again soon.